Good afternoon and welcome to the AHDB Dairy webinar on controlling digital dermatitis. I'm Hannah Lilburn, Knowledge Exchange Manager at AHDB Dairy, and today I'm joined by Roger Blowy and Amy Gillespie. Roger Blowy has spent the majority of his 50 plus years in, pra in practice providing a farm animal vet service to clients in the Gloucestershire area, and naturally dealing with lame cows has been an important part of that. Roger has been involved with digital dermatitis research at Liverpool University for the past 30 years, where he is an honorary research fellow. Pre-COVID, he lectured widely at home and overseas and is the author of several books. Good afternoon, Roger. Hi, all. And Amy is a farm animal vet working at the University of Liverpool and is currently undertaking her PhD on the subject of digital dermatitis. And good afternoon to you, Amy. Hi, Hannah. Thanks for the intro. <laughs> I'd just like to outline a couple of housekeeping points. Um, all attendees are muted, um, but you can ask a question using the message box on the right side of your screen by clicking the orange arrow to expand. All, a question, all questions are anonymous, um, so please feel free to ask a question or even share your own experiences. Today's webinar will also be recorded uh, and available via the AHDB website and YouTube afterwards. If you are registered with Dairy Pro, please provide your name, farm name, postcode, and Dairy Pro number in the message box to receive your points. If you don't have your Dairy Pro uh, number to hand, just type in uh, your email address and we can follow that up. And we'll aim to finish at 1 p.m. today. And this is just how to ask a question. If you um, click the orange arrow on the right side of your screen to expand and then go down to questions, there's a box there for you to ask your questions. I'd now like to pass over to Roger for today's presentation. Thank you, Roger. All right. Um, thank you, Hannah. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. And thanks very much for joining us. Um, uh, just an introductory note for those of you who have um, previously seen uh webinars on lameness um particularly from nick bell that a hairstyle like this is not uh, a definite prerequisite for dealing with lameness in cattle i just thought i needed to get that out uh, in the open first so anyway let's go on to more serious things so in in very broad terms lameness in cattle can be subdivided into two um two areas there's hoof lameness and soft tissue lameness the hoof lameness generally associated with physical trauma, so sole ulcers, white line disease, and things like that. Uh, the soft tissue lameness primarily associated with infectious conditions. So we have digital dermatitis, uh, which is, of course, um, the subject of today's webinar, uh, and foul of the foot, which I will mention briefly because I think quite a lot of people don't appreciate that the control measures for digital dermatitis also very much apply uh, to foul of the foot so next slide please so let's do foul of the foot first so foul is caused by two different bacteria fusobacter and bacteroides doesn't really matter what they're called but um, they are two distinct bacteria and the important thing about foul of the foot is that uh, it infects and affects the deeper layers uh, of the of the foot tissue uh, and produces a, a necrosis so the infection gets in there and leads to rotting of the tissue deep within the foot and because of that uh, you get a marked swelling of the foot uh, and because it's deep within the foot uh, then uh, you need to treat with uh, injectable antibiotics obviously the picture that's there on the right hand side is uh, is an extreme version. Next slide, please. Digital dermatitis, I guess everyone will have seen it, and uh, you've got the standard lesion there on the, on the left-hand side. Um, so digital dermatitis is caused by three different uh, treponeme bacteria, treponema media, treponema pedis, or pedis, some people call it, and treponema phagidenis. Now, the Treponemes affect the surface of the skin. You'll have to forgive me for picking up feet as I go along. I simply find it impossible not to give a, 
uh, to give a talk with um, about feet and not handling feet. So you just have to put up with this bit. So the the um, uh, the digital dermatitis infection primarily um, infects uh, this space here um, uh, between the the bulbs of the heel, and it affects primarily the surface of the skin, the epidermis. Although some of the treponemes can penetrate more deeply down into the dermis um, and, and get right down um, in very in very deep, but because it's a surface infection, for most animals, topical treatment um, is adequate. Next slide, please. So where did it come from? Well, interestingly enough, it's a relatively new disease. Well, new to me anyway. When I was at college, we certainly weren't taught anything about it. Uh, it was first reported by Celli and Mortellaro in Italy in 1972. Um, and as recent experience has shown us, disease can spread very, very quickly um, across the world. Uh, and certainly that's happened with, uh, with digital dermatitis. So first reported in Italy in 1972, it then spread up across Europe. Netherlands, France and so on um, in the late 70s and early 1980s and it was first reported in the UK in 1985 probably uh, but no direct proof probably associated with a batch of imported uh, Dutch heifers and certainly when I first came across it in, um, in 1985 uh, I wondered what on earth it was and I don't think I'd seen um, any uh, anything like it um, in the past. <clears throat> Current estimates suggest that it now accounts for around 30% of all lame cows uh, for um, various reasons I'll talk about in a moment. And because of that, it's probably why we haven't seen a big reduction in lameness um, since the 1980s. Next slide, please. So you will have all seen uh, digital dermatitis. The slide on the left um, is your typical lesion. Uh, and they're often referred to as the um, M scoring, the, 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 the different types of lesions. So M0 uh, would be a digital dermatitis, would be normal skin, uh, the, the nice smooth skin um, up here in the, in the interdigital cleft. Um, uh, M2 is the, the red raw lesion that you can see on the, on the left. Um, this is the one that causes quite a lot of pain. Um, and if you see the standing animal, you often see them, don't you, standing on the, the tips of their toes. And in fact, interestingly enough, when we first came across the disease, then some animals spent so long standing on their toes until we found out how to treat it, that they totally wore through uh, to the corium of their toe. Now the, the M4 lesion, the slide you can see on the right of the, um, of the screen, the M4 lesion is, is the, the chronic stage. Uh, I'll refer to uh, similarities with mastitis quite a lot, but this would be your sort of your chronic staph aureus uh, case. No clots in the milk, and in this case, no lameness um, in the animal. Uh, but uh, there is infection there, and this represents a source of infection to other cows. So therefore, this stage is important. Next slide, please. Slide on the left is what you could get um, if you didn't treat it. Um, it is a slide, to be fair, that somebody actually uh, sent to me. Uh, so it's not, I, I've never seen one as bad as that myself. Um, but I have seen some real humdinging big lesions um, on the um, on the heels of cattle, uh, and in an instance like the one on the left, and, and the large lesions that I've seen, particularly in beef cattle, uh, then I would certainly uh, be talking about injectable treatments uh, for animals like that. But that is an extreme. One of the other things I'd like to point out is that I think that in a proportion of cases, digital dermatitis and fowl ap appear to coexist. So if you have a look at the, the slide on the, the right, you can see the, the circular area um, of, looks like an M2 lesion of digital dermatitis, but you see how the foot is also swollen uh, and there's a little bit of a crack going up between the interdigital cleft. Well, in feet like that, 
I think we've got a combination of digital dermatitis and foul. So in this one, you would need to use both injectable treatment um, and topical treatment. Next slide, please. Now, after we had digital dermatitis for, I don't know, 10 years it would have been, it certainly wasn't until in the 90s we came across this. Um, uh, for some reason or other, the digital dermatitis seemed to start um, infecting the corium um, of the foot. Now, if you look at the central um, slide, um, whoever, Alex, you got the cursor, I think, haven't you? So if you look at the central slide, that's, that's right. Yeah, perfect. Move it down a little bit, please. Yeah, fine. So do you see there? So on that foot, I put the cursor back on, please. On that foot, I would removed all the underrun horn. Uh, having removed the underrun horn, uh, then the pinky yellowy tissue that you can see is the layer of new horn being produced by the corium. And that's what we used to see a lot of. If you go to the slide on the left, now, please. Uh, now, that's the right. It was the right of me, anyway. That's right. Yeah, that's that's one. So, <laughs> sorry about my staff. Um, so if you go to the slide on, on, on the left, the one with a bit of blood in the middle, do you see there? So that's, again, is corium. But you see how it's got a red stippled appearance. Um, uh, it, it's moist. Um, and if you, um, for those attending the seminar, if you put your nose up really close to the screen and sniff, you can smell that it's got a, a, an appalling pungent smell. I can certainly smell it from where I am anyway. And it, a really strong smell that um, shows that that's digital dermatitis infection affecting the corium. And of course, the other place we get it is on the right hand side of the screen, the toe necrosis where the digital dermatitis gets in there and, uh, and burrows into the, the tip of the foot uh, and uh, has, a, has a big effect um, on the pedal bone. Next slide, please. So, Roger, we've had our first question come in. Um, and it was, as it has cost the UK dairy industry millions of pounds, does it not make you question um, sort of the merits of still allowing uh, live imports into the UK? But if it wasn't such an open forum, Hannah, that I would have said that um, in some ways you could almost say that digital dermatitis is as important as foot and mouth, because when foot and mouth gets in, at least we know um, how to eliminate it. Unfortunately, with digital dermatitis gets in, um, because we can't be sure um, in many cases which are the carrier animals, it's almost in, uh, impossible to get rid of it. But um, yes, I would agree with the questioner that uh, it is um, it is something that we really need to be very careful about um, and in the future when this sort of thing happens I mean, it was the most crazy lapse of biosecurity um, that there can have been. We saw this disease coming up across Europe and I'm afraid we did nothing, um, nothing about controlling it. Okay, thank you. So, um, to carry on with the, the talk, <clears throat> if you have a look at the picture on the left, you can see that's the normal smooth base of a pedal bone. So if I take this um, bone here and actually take it out of the foot so um, and turn the, the bone across like that, can you see how the base of the pedal bone, I'll use a pencil, I was doing feet yesterday and my fingers are still a bit mucky, um, you can still see how the base of the pedal bone here um, is smooth. If I turn it over like that, uh, do you see that it's really smooth? Now, if we have um, digital dermatitis infection on the corium, as well as the corium producing the hoof, the corium also um, feeds and remodels the bone. So if the digital dermatitis continually inflames the base of the bone, then you change from a bone like that uh, to a bone like this. If we look here now, and I turn it, if I can get it on the right angle of the screen, do you see these spikes coming down here uh, from the from the base of the bone where my finger is? And they're quite sharp. I can I can actually push that um, into the bottom of my finger. So now we have a situation where we have inflammation um, on the corium, 
from the digital dermatitis at the bottom, we have these spikes above the corium pinching into the corium um, and not surprisingly um, you don't get uh, good healing. In fact, if the condition is allowed to persist, the, the foot will go from a nice normal foot like this uh, to something like this one. So here is a, a foot here uh, that had toe necrosis. You can see the toe necrosis lesion. And these bits here, the swelling there um, and the swelling here, all of this is new bone associated with uh, an excess of inflammation within the foot. Uh, and I don't believe that I've seen this sort of thing anywhere near as badly in the past um, as when digital dermatitis started causing this in the 1990s. So when you see these cows with these big swellings around the top of the foot, then uh, this is associated uh, with new bone, bone formation um, and the inflammation. Can we go back to the slides, Hannah, please? Okay, so yeah, I think we've done that. So next slide, please. So um, the title, it can be controlled. Uh, and uh, the next stage then uh, is to look at control measures. And um, Amy is going to take us around a client's farm and uh, where Amy and I, in fact, did quite a lot of uh, research work. And uh, we're going to talk about some of the control measures um, that are, and um, in some cases are not, uh, being carried out on that farm. So um, over to you, Amy. Well, I hope over to you, Amy. You will have anyway, noticed that the title we're told of this that a video is going to be shown in any minute now, folks. Can be well, give us a bit of time. We'll and get I'm there going in a minute. to focus on some of the Very aspects sure. that are key to reducing and case numbers and case severity. But firstly, it's important to note that if your herd is free from DD, then it is so important to avoid buying in animals, as this has been identified as the most significant risk for disease introduction. If you must buy in, make sure you inspect all cows' feet and quarantine them in separate housing and implement a preventative foot bathing regime. But bear in mind that even with every effort made, bought in animals are still a risk to a DD free herd because some lesions cannot be seen by eye and some may take weeks to develop to a visible stage. Conversely, some may progress from M0 status, so apparently uninfected, to the chronic M4 status in less than a week and catch you out. It is also thought, although very difficult to prove, that introduction of different species or strains of treponemes may cause outbreaks on farms or increase the severity of an existing disease burden. Once DD is endemic in a herd, our main aim is to reduce transmission between cows. Hygiene in the housing and foot cleanliness is important for this because we know that continual exposure to slurry makes skin more susceptible to DD infection by damaging the protective outer layers. We know from experimental infection models designed to replicate DD that skin damage greatly increases the risk of a foot developing a DD problem. It's possible that the bacteria responsible for DD can live in the slurry, but research has not been able to prove this, and so it is currently regarded more as a vehicle for spreading disease rather than as a definitive source of disease. When it comes to optimising housing, many of the measures that we champion for controlling mastitis also apply to the control of digital dermatitis. In fact, when looking critically at your own housing, it may help to think of digital dermatitis as a mastitis of the foot. So let's take a look now at some important aspects of housing for DD control. Here you can see a relatively narrow passageway in cubicle housing, where it's possible for slurry to accumulate to harmful depths. Automatic scrapers have to be used here to improve housing hygiene. 
If you have automatic scrapers on your farm, consider how frequently they're set to run and whether it's enough to prevent slurry buildup. Preventing buildup of slurry is also important in other areas of high cow traffic, most notably the collecting yard and other areas in the vicinity of the milking parlour. Depending on where your heifers are housed in relation to the milking herd and milking parlour, you may need to consider how you scrape these areas to avoid scraping contaminated slurry towards the heifer housing. Wider passageways in cubicle housing, uh, for example 3.6 metres is recommended, will help to prevent slurry from accumulating to harmful depths. Frequent scraping is still required but as illustrated here, significant slurry contamination is less likely to occur and compromise foot cleanliness. Improving lying times by providing comfortable bedding will also improve foot hygiene, as cows spend less time standing in slurry contaminated areas. Here is an example of deep sand bedding, which is widely regarded as the best system for improving lying times. So I'm going to move on now and talk about some top tips for effective foot bathing, which is an important aspect of digital dermatitis control. There are many considerations in foot bath design, and I would recommend you use the AHDB foot, foot bath fitness test document to reassess your own practices on your farm. The important things to consider are cow flow, where and when are the cows going through the foot bath and can this be done without disrupting milking and without having to drive them through? Does the walking surface provide enough traction for safety but without damaging the feet? What are the foot bath dimensions and therefore the volume? It's very important that the products used are measured correctly each time to ensure the concentration in the foot bath is as intended. Cleanliness is important to ensure the product remains effective as they will not be tested ab above 20 grams per litre of organic matter contamination. I'll illustrate these points in more detail in the video. This foot bath is situated after the parlour exit. It's wide enough for two cows to pass through together, which can be beneficial for cow flow. The grooved concrete walking surface is the same as th throughout the collecting yard and parlour, so is familiar to the cows. The full length is 3.8 metres, which allows each foot to be submerged at least twice as cows walk through. The entry and the exit from the foot bath slopes, making the depth of solution 10 centimetres to the overflow at the deepest point, which is a little short of the 12 centimetres recommended to ensure the skin horn junction is covered, including at the front of the foot. But there is extra depth to prevent excessive loss of solution from splashing. The overall calculated foot bath volume is 600 litres. This farm uses formalin as the foot bathing biocide, which is a popular choice, but it is a known carcinogen and must be handled appropriately according to labelled instructions by a competent person. Here, appropriate personal protective equipment is available and of course it needs to be worn. Formalin is measured in a marked 20 litre closed container, then is added to the foot bath manually. It is possible to install pipes to fill the foot bath directly, which would avoid the risk to farm staff from handling this carcinogen. Um, but it is feasible to have a protocol that includes adequate safety precautions without going to those lengths. This video is demonstrating safe measuring of 20 litres of formalin into a closed container. This is then added to the 600 litres of water in the foot bath, giving a 3.3% formalin solution. As I've already said, products used in foot baths are tested to check how effective they are, up to a concentration of 20 grams per litre of organic matter. Beyond this level of manure contamination, it's unknown how effective these products are. Therefore, as a rule of thumb, it's recommended to drain and refill a foot bath after enough cows have been through to amount to one litre per cow of active solution. Refilling is also important because as the solution is used, the depth will decrease and the foot bath will no longer be submerging the entire hoof. 
Recent surveys have shown that excessive manure contamination and insufficient depth are very common shortcomings with foot bathing regimes, which will impact how effective they are. Let's have a look now at some cows coming through. You can see that cow flow is good. They come through here twice at daily every day, so they are very used to this process. I've slowed the video slightly so you can appreciate that each foot gets submerged at least twice and mostly three times. You can also see the depth and how that does reach the skin horn junction despite earlier reservations about the depth. There are 260 cows coming through here twice a day, so in effect 520 cows in total. Therefore, our, our rule of thumb that we stick to at least one litre of solution per cow is easily fulfilled, so we expect the solution would remain effective. Foot bathing of heifers and dry cows is also important and often overlooked. A number of environmental factors thought to influence development of DD during first lactation have been investigated. And the only thing found to make a difference was whether or not heifers had lesions prior to calving or at the time of calving. Remember, lesions can develop very quickly and therefore preventative foot bathing needs to be carried out frequently in these groups. To facilitate this, foot bathing facilities for heifers and dry cows should be integral to the housing. This is an example of a heifer foot bath. The same considerations apply as for foot bath design for cows. This foot bath here is shorter than ideal at just two metres and the depth at least on paper is, uh, is too shallow at eight centimetres. Having said that, if we have a look at some of the heifers coming through, you can see that in this case their feet still do get submerged twice and the skin horn junctions are covered. Hopefully this video so far has given you a few ideas on how to assess your current housing management and foot bathing regime to improve digital dermatitis control on your farm. I'm now going to talk about hygiene during foot trimming which is a relatively new area under investigation as a control point for spread of DD. Research has identified lack of hygiene during foot trimming as a risk factor for increased digital dermatitis prevalence in herds. Treponemes have been frequently identified on trimmer gloves and hoof knives, and recent research has shown that treponemes can be cultured from hoof knives after trimming, especially where contact has been made with a DD lesion for treatment. Treponemes can survive on hoof knife blades for at least two hours. A survey of farmers, veterinary surgeons and foot trimmers carried out in 2019 showed that less than half of operators consider hand or hoof knife hygiene during foot trimming. University of Liverpool researchers and AHDB Dairy have developed a hygiene protocol to try to help reduce the spread of DD during foot trimming. This video demonstrates how to use the hygiene protocol. Make sure you're wearing clean gloves and ensure that hoof knives are free from visible dirt prior to foot trimming. Foot knives should be submerged in disinfectant for 20 seconds before use. This cow was seen primarily for treatment of the M4 lesion. So as you can see, there isn't a great deal of tri trimming required. To treat the lesion, we need to remove the dead scab that is covering it, as we know that the treponemes live a bit deeper down in the skin and we need our topical treatment spray to come into contact with them directly. We know that treponemes can be cultured from hoof knives after trimming of infected cows in 5% of cases, and where contact has been made with the lesion itself, treponemes can be cultured in 42% of cases. This tells us that hoof knives have very high levels of contamination with treponemes in this setting. To prevent transmission of treponemes to the next foot, clean both your gloves and hoof knives in soapy water to remove visible dirt. Drying knives and gloves with clean paper towel will also help to remove visible dirt. 
These steps will ensure that the disinfectant remains effective. Return your hoof knife to the disinfectant for at least 20 seconds before the next use. It might be helpful to use alternate pairs of knives for each foot to ensure adequate disinfectant contact time. 2% Vercon, 2% sodium hypochlorite and the iodine-based disinfectant FAM30 used at a 1 in 100 concentration have been shown to be effective for this use. So in summary, this video has hopefully challenged you to think about a number of ways in which you could improve digital dermatitis control on your farm. We've looked at the risks of buying in and how best to mitigate them if this is unavoidable. We've taken a look at housing hygiene and how to avoid slurry buildup, which can be responsible for damaging the foot skin and for spreading the disease. We've covered some tips on how to check and optimise the foot bathing regime. And finally, I've discussed the emerging importance of good hygiene during foot trimming and recommendations for best practice. Thank you for your attention. Roger has a few more messages for us now and then we will be able to take your questions. Thank you, Amy, for that video. Um, I believe some people's sound was uh, maybe not working the best there. Um, so don't worry, the video will be available uh, afterwards on YouTube. Um, so don't panic about that if you maybe couldn't hear or see it properly. Um, Amy, we had a question come through for you. And that is, I've been told formulin loses its effect once two cows have mucked into the foot bath. Is this true? Um, two, <laughs> that's very specific. Um, so we know that all, um, all products are tested um, up to this threshold of 20 grams per litre of organic matter. So the, the trials um, for approved products involve um contaminating uh water with uh 20 grams of manure uh foot per litre uh, and then using that solution to see if it will kill bacteria now the range of bacteria it's tested against doesn't necessarily include treponemes and um, there is an official list of what it has to be tested against um so this is all um, uh, well previously was was eu regulation um so uh that that is the testing that we do so i i would feel that two cows mucking in a foot bath would not inactivate your formalin um we tend to come there, there have been a few surveys of exactly how many cows passing through the foot bath tends to result in that level of, of exceeding that level of contamination and that's how we get to this rule of thumb of one litre of solution per cow will the vast vast majority of time uh, of the time be enough and um, that 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 limit isn't exceeded um, but yeah I mean having having um, a system where the cows flow through nicely and they're not all um, mucking in the foot bath is, is obviously going to be preferable for trying to keep that solution clean and effective. Well, that leads me on to my next question, Amy, and that's um, do you know how long the treponemes can survive in the environment? Um, so I guess the problem uh, in the environment, uh, the, the main problem we have with the, tre with the treponemes is that they're very, very difficult to culture. So we tend to be able to detect their DNA um, in all sorts of places in the environment. Um, but actually getting them to grow uh, is it proves very, very difficult. Um, so in terms of how long, it depends on the conditions. Um, there have been kind of mocked up lab experiments where we try to simulate things like um, sort of piles of manure or bits of bedding um, and sort of artificially put the treponemes inside those kind of models and see how long they can live there where we can actually measure their growth um, and their survival. 
and it depends on the species of treponeme, um, but it is possible for them to live in, in, in lab conditions um, for a few days like that. Um, I certainly know that, um, again, under lab conditions where I've tested it, I can, I can keep them on hoof knives for, for a couple of hours. Um, so that's kind of the data that we that we have to go with, but the um, the real life scenario on farm is a, is a bit more difficult. We have we're not able to actually measure live treponemes in various places in the environment, um, and as I say, it is almost certainly because they're difficult to culture. So by the time you take your samples, transport them to the laboratory, um, give them all the the right feed and things that they like to live in um, to try and grow them up, you've, you're probably losing an awful lot there. Um, so we did get we did get the 40% uh, culture rate from the hoof knives that had been in contact with the digital dermatitis lesions, um, which was actually much higher than I was expecting to get um, because of all those reasons. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, I hope that answers your question, but if, if not, do uh, probe, probe further. And we have also a couple of questions coming through in regards to formalin and maybe sort of the availability of it in the future, um, yeah. that it won't be available. So uh, what else could you recommend other than formalin for foot bathing? Yeah, okay. Um, I believe, Roger, you, you've got a bit coming up that's a bit on this, um, so I, I won't still, still he's, he's thunder too much, but um, you're quite right. Um, there have been, uh, for a long time, questions over whether formalin, because of potential carcinogenic effects, should be available uh, for farming use, um, and there is still always um, the threat that, that it could be taken away. Um, I guess what I would say is that um, the the content, what you're using in the foot bath, the product, particular product that you're using, um, I don't think is the main issue. It's more to do with how clean it is. Are the foot getting dunked? Are the feet getting dunked properly? How often are you doing it? Um, and those things are the things that most most farms would need to optimize rather than the actual product and also are you measuring the product so you're actually definitely got the correct concentration every single time you use it um, in again in laboratory experiments um treponemes are, are not that difficult to kill um, so if they did take formal in a way I wouldn't be too concerned. All these kind of proprietary products, um, I, I think any of them would, would be fine. Even just, um, but will we know that if we wash our hands even just with, with soap, um, that would get rid of treponemes. So, um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't worry too much about the product. It's, it's more about using it correctly. But as I say, Roger's got some more to say about that as well. And then just one final question before we move uh, on to you, Roger, again. Um, and a couple of people have saying they uh, go through a water foot bath or pressure wash the cow's feet before they go for uh, through the formalin foot bath. And is that beneficial? Yeah, there's conflicting there's conflicting advice on that. Um, common sense would would assume that that would be helpful. Um, again, at keeping your actual active ingredient foot bath cleaner um, and some people find that when you um, if you put cows through a pre-wash like a water pre-wash if they're going to muck if they're going to put dung in there they'll do it then and then it keeps the treatment bath cleaner um, so I would certainly say that that's um, a good idea it, it's not necessarily always followed in trials like that. So when people have looked at how dirty does the foot bath actually get, um, it, it doesn't necessarily add up just exactly the same. Um, so so yeah, while while common sense would would suggest that would be a good idea, um, as I say, the the, re the research side doesn't necessarily back that up every single time someone's looked at it. Um, the other quick point just to mention with uh, pressure washing the feet 
is um, where where is that happening and are we actually at risk of aerosolizing lots of um, treponemes and potentially the other bacteria Roger mentioned that are commonly found on feet like the fusobacter and bacteroides and actually is that is that something we would rather not be doing um, so uh, but I, but we're not I, I don't have the answer to that um, I'm afraid and sorry, I did say that the last one, but I've, I've got another quick one, and it's how often should we fit bath dry cows? Um, well, I, I think the, the kind of easy answer to that is as, as often as, as you possibly can. Um, and I think in order to do that on the vast majority of farms, that would involve some change to the housing so that you can you can get them through. I mean, I would always say every day. <laughs> um, uh, but it comes down to the practicality of it. I think there is um, a scenario where lesions can go from this on this M scale from zero to to appearing at two very very quickly within within two or three days. Um, so I would say that if you, sort of twice a week, for example, probably isn't enough. Um, so. I think it comes down to practicality. Ideal world, I would obviously say every day, um, every every other day, I think should pro should probably be enough. But it's it's quite a lot, and and as I say, for the majority of farms, um, I think to be able to do that in a practical sense would actually need to 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 somehow incorporate that specifically in the dry cow housing. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Amy. And Roger, I'll just pass back over to you and then we'll come back to um, some of those questions that we maybe haven't answered at the end. Thanks, Roger. OK, thank you very much. And uh, thanks, Amy, for um, uh, giving us a, a, a good insight into the various control measures available. Next slide, please. So with any disease, if you can measure it, you can manage it. And I think it's really important that you do make an effort uh, to measure digital dermatitis and really measure lameness generally. Very simply, um, I'd measure all lame cow treatments, um, tot them up at the end of the month, um, and each month group them into infectious and non-infectious conditions. Um, so infectious DD and foul, non-infectious soul ulcers, white line disease, because if you then monitor this on a monthly basis, you'll be able to see when you're getting a, a bit of an increase in foul, a bit of an increase in digiderm, um, look back at what you've done, and it'll give you some indication as to whether or not uh, your control measures um, are, are good enough. Um, Amy's already talked about uh, washing feet. Uh, you certainly are able to see the DD lesions much easier if you do wash the feet, um, but I have to say it's, it's not essential. Um, I would suggest you do this every few months, have a look at the number proportion of cows that are infected. Um, my own target in an infected herd, I'd want to see less than 25% of cows with any lesion at all, and no cows um, with uh, and the M2, the red raw lesion. The monitoring progress is part of the five point plan for the control of Digiderm. I don't know how many of you have had a look at it. I've given you the website there on the slide. Next slide, please. And in this next slide, it talks about um, the, the five point plan. I've no intention of going through it in, in detail. You can look at it yourself. But I think it's quite useful to look at the different steps and the different stages in in the control of any disease so point one external biosecurity keep it out how did it come in the first place most probably by um with bought in cattle but um other things are possible sheep can bring it in um, equipment and visitors could bring it in and, and so on point two internal biosecurity how do we prevent it from spreading and Amy's talked about that uh, quite a lot already. The major factors, of course, being keeping the feet clean, um, giving the cows plenty of space, um, passageways, um, and, uh, and, and things like that. Early identification and recording, well, I, I really already talked about that. It is important that you 
have targets and 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 you know how it's what's happening um within the herd frequent foot disinfection cr absolutely critical point uh, that is um and i'm going to come back to that a little bit more in a moment um define and monitor the the targets so that's the number of cases that you're getting uh, and by all means, uh, have a look at that. There are there is a lot more detail um, in the five point plan. Next slide, please. How about the next slide? Bit of trouble there. Hannah. Bit of trouble there, Hannah. Alex has gone to sleep. I yeah, think somebody give her a shout. The bath chemicals. It's it's up there. Um, yeah, got it now. Thank you very much. Well, my maybe it was mine that was a bit slow. Um, so foot bath chemicals um, commonly talked about, and I would reiterate um, what Amy has said, the best teat dip is the teat dip that totally covers every teat at every milking. So in other words, yes, there will be a variety in, in the chemicals, but it depends on the way in which the chemical is used that's uh, as important as anything. So we started off using antibiotics and that's the trouble with writing books you put it in a book and then afterwards you regret it um, because we no longer um, uh, use antibiotics there is no excuse for using them at all i don't think um, it's it's a massive contributor to high antibiotic use there's an increased use of um, uh, increased risk of antimicrobial resistance and of course we have issues of meat and milk um, withdrawal. Uh, there should be 28 days meat and seven days milk because there's no licensed product. Formalin is a licensed biocide and remains a licensed biocide. Uh, I do take the point that the previous um, one of the questioners made about how long it's um, are going to last for. I don't know the answer for that to that, but I bet they've been talking about banning it for at least, at least the last 15 years. Um, so we just have to wait and see. Uh, formalin is a potential carcinogen, um, and Amy has quite rightly pointed out that uh, we need to be careful with it. And I think as as vets and and you as um, herd owners and managers and so on, we need to remember that it's our responsibility to make sure that people are aware um, of the PPE and training requirement. One of the advantages of slurry is, of course, it's rapidly degraded um, in, in slurry. So it goes to carbon dioxide and water in, in, um, in no time at all, particularly if it's warm. Copper sulfate is an alternative chemical. Uh, less used now, it, it, it is no longer an EU licensed biocide, so you're in a bit of a problem there. It's very slow degradation in, in slurry. Uh, it's a higher cost, uh, and you, you may be aware of issues um, in the US, particularly where they've used huge amounts in footpaths, it's gone out in the slurry, um, and so high levels of copper in the slurry um, have resulted in decreased plant growth. And then there's a whole range of organic acids um, that could be used, formic acid, glutaraldehyde, salicylic acid, um, you're probably aware that some people use salicylic acid uh, itself um, as, a, as a treatment for digital dermatitis and, and other lesions, just applying it to the foot. And uh, I mentioned one, um, one of the potential products there. So the will, there is a, a wide range of products um, and um, uh, they all do work. Next slide, please. So in summary, uh, and I think this is my last slide, but I can't remember actually. In summary, um, digital dermatitis control. As with any disease, we need to understand the infection process. If we understand the infectious pro infection process, how do they get infected? Why do they get infected? What makes the infection worse? Um, uh, then we'll be much more able to um, understand the control process. And a, a few little things, topping up a little bit about what Amy says, um, in terms of, of different types of bedding. So um, we know, for example, that 
um, it survives for a little while in sand, whereas if you mix your sand with lime, then the mixture of lime, lime and sand that we tried um, in using a, a laboratory trial, digiderm um, disappears really quickly. So just basic hygiene, like adding a bit of sanitizer to your bedding is going to um, happen. It's going to help. Digital dermatitis has been referred to as mastitis of the foot. So let's just think about that in these final points. First of all, we know other cows are a reservoir infection. We know that if we've got clinical cases, we need to treat those clinical cases uh, to prevent the spread. We know that attention to the environment um, is really important. Maintain a good, uh, clean environment. And just like mastitis, we know that controlling disease in dry cows and pre-calving heifers is essential. Personally, I think that your heifers and dry cows should go through your foot bath once a day. If it's easily done and it's part of the routine, it'll be done on a regular basis. If you think to yourself, oh, I'll, I'll do it once a week. When that day in the week comes, there's a risk you're not gonna get around to it. Whereas if it's part of the routine and they have to walk through the foot bath to come up to the feed face, uh, then it's going to be done. If we keep cows clean and we foot bath them regularly, I can assure you digital dermatitis can be controlled. So why not give it a go? Thank you, Hannah. Brilliant, Roger. Thank you both. And we have lots of questions coming in for you both. Um, so I might just start with, um, if you continually, continually foot bath, can a resistance to treatment develop? I don't think there's any, I've heard that express, uh, talked about lots of times. I don't think there's any evidence for that whatsoever. Not that we know of. Um, no. We've also had somebody uh, with DD has spread to the cow's udders. Uh, what would you recommend to treat this with? Oh, yeah, that's the pits, isn't it? The, the, um, the cleft at the front of the udder and that can condition the teat necrosis, um, which is become more common, which may also be um, uh, an issue. I'm afraid I don't have any good treatment for the ischemic teat necrosis. That's the one where you get the, the bit of crustiness at the base of the teat udder junction. And in severe teat cases, the teat just, um, the heifer licks the teat off because it's mainly um, early lactation heifers. For those, get to it really early, just as the scab is forming, for goodness sake, apply lots of emollient to the scab, preferably mixed with salicylic acid. Um, and if it doesn't look to be healing, stop milking that teat uh, for a week or five uh, to allow it to heal. For the ones in front of the udder, really good cleaning um, of the affected um, area. It's not easy to get up there with a, go, go with a cloth or something and clean it off. Um, and then apply um, some uh, topical treatment. Um, hydrogen peroxide derivatives go diluted, obviously, uh, work okay. I think your Oxytet spray works reasonably okay. Uh, but I don't have any, if it's a really bad lesion, then um, um, injectable antibiotics, but I'm afraid I don't have any um, uh, quick fix uh, treatment for those. Sorry. And there's a couple of questions around this um, topic, actually. And it's, is there any research that confirms that the use of a, uh, like something like uh, washing up liquid with an active ingredient like formalin is useful? I know a lot of farmers that are using this in their foot baths. Do you mean um, together? In the so foot bath? So using like very liquid in, in a foot bath, yeah. And the is, formalin at the same time? Or? Yeah, yeah, to, make, to help it um, like a, Maybe to stick to the to the hoof. Ah, um, well, that's not something I have, of course. Detergent cool. would help it to penetrate, so I can see the logic in that. And the cleaner the feet are, the better. Um, uh, if the 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 soap would remove the uh, the layer, if there was uh, fat in the uh, around the foot, the detergent would help to remove that. I can see no disadvantage, but I don't have a lot of experience with it. Okay. Thank you. Um, someone else has a very aggressive type of um, DD currently in the milking cows. 
what would you recommend to attack that with as they're already uh, foot dipping as much as possible? Um, yeah, for many years, I, I have had a routine of, and I didn't actually talk about it, but in terms of um, severe cases of, of, of DD, um, and personally, I think it's acceptable um, to go into what I call an ag aggressive routine. So if they haven't been using formalin at all, then um, introduce it slowly if you've got a lot of M2 lesions. So something like 2% um, formalin for the four or five days, maybe a week, and then to 4% for a week, and then to 8% for a week, uh, uh, and even um, in severe cases, I've taken it up to a 10% for a week. Don't do the 10% in the summer. Um, there is evidence that uh, associated with hot weather and rapid drying of, um, of the formalin, uh, then you'll get uh, some skin changes. And you'll also find, I'm afraid, with 10% formalin, they struggle. Sometimes you'll struggle to get the cows to go through it um, because of the fumes that are coming off. But I've used that on numerous occasions, um, and I don't remember that ever not working. You obviously minimize the, the period of time you're using the 10% formalin for, make absolutely sure that you're not getting formalin fumes going into the, the milking parlor. And as soon as you've, you've done your well, maximum of a week at 10%, drop that back right back down then uh, to three or 4%. And I think that um, in my experience, you'll find that will control it. But it's got to be daily, twice a day, every day, including the Sabbath. <laughs> Thanks, Roger. And um, is bovine digi the same as CODD in sheep and can cross SPP in infection occur? Yes. <laughs> you want That's to a short <laughs> yeah. Do you want to elaborate? Uh, what, what, I it's the same uh that we we know for sure that there's there's a big overlap in the, in the treponemes and treponeme species and that's why um it's possible to bring effectively bring bovine digital dermatitis into a herd if there's co-grazing with sheep so yeah it is it is possible so if you are grazing sheep, for goodness sake allow um a few weeks after the sheep have left before you allow cattle back onto that um, onto that pasture we don't actually know how long the digital dermatitis lives on um, on the pasture but treponema higher dysenteriae which is a that causes swine dysentery in pigs we know lasts in buildings um, for up to six weeks so um, i would suggest if you possibly can you leave eight weeks between the sheep going and the cattle going out on the pasture Great, thank you. And then one final question, and that is, do you think it's possible to get rid of dermatitis once it's in the herd, um, if even if there are cows with M4 lesions? Um, I don't know of any herd um, where the digital dermatitis, um, once it's in, um, has uh, has disappeared, even with all the control measures we've um, we've um, we've talked about. I know of plenty of herds. But I've had an issue with digital dermatitis um, and that it's right up down to a low level of M4 lesions um, using the control measures we've talked about, you know, the lime in the sand and the frequent foot bath and things like that. Um, but to get rid of it um, uh, altogether, um, I'm not aware that anybody has ever done that. And actually, we just had a question come right in there, um, and we haven't actually talked much around it, uh, and that's around bedding. And obviously, Amy, you mentioned sand. Is there anything specific to consider for other types of bedding? As in to, I assume we mean to sort of reduce the treponeme survival in the bedding. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, similar to what Roger said um, before, um, we know that mixing with with lime uh, is like well from laboratory experience anyway is likely to reduce treponeme survival 
um, compared to just just the bedding alone. Um, now you're testing my memory. I think, oh, Roger, I don't know if you can remember, but I think maybe is sawdust better than straw? Right, so we tested a range of beddings, um, uh, took samples from of unused bedding from the farm, took them to the lab, um, sterilised them, added the digiderm to them, and then a look to see how long the digiderm survived in, in the bedding. Um, I'm not going to, we don't have time to go through the times, uh, but um, essentially if it's dry straw, if it's dry straw, um, then the survival rate um, survival time was extremely short. Um, in sand, it did survive for a few hours, but if you added lime to the sand, uh, then uh, you had a, a zero survival time. Now, adding the digi digiderm and testing the sand 15 minutes later, you still couldn't find it. But remember that digiderm does not grow below a certain pH if it's acid, um, and above it does not grow above a certain no, it doesn't survive a cer above a certain pH so if you can keep your sand at above pH 9.5 you will kill off strep uberus you will kill off e coli and you will kill off digital dermatitis so it's adding the sanitizer to the bedding whether it be lime um, or sawdust uh, which is so helpful in the control yeah. Thank you very much, both Roger and Amy. There was lots of questions coming in there, and I'm sorry if we didn't get round to answering yours. Uh, Alex, if you want to jump on to the next slide for me, thank you. Uh, yeah, HDB has uh, a range of resources um, that can help you out. Um, we have just launched our new Healthy Feet Light program uh, last week, and you can find your local mobility mentor to help you with that uh, on our HDB web. We have a web page on there dedicated to um, lameness. You can find uh, that foot, foot, foot bath uh, fitness test that Amy mentioned, uh, resources on lesion and mobility scorecards. Um, we also have a podcast that went live uh, last Friday with Owen Atkinson and we have uh, some cattle handling webinars also coming up in the next um, month or so with uh, Temple Grandin, Neil Chesterton and York Friesen. And um, we also at HTB we have just launched our new five-year strategy, and um, so there's an opportunity for you to feed back into that strategy right up until the 31st of January. Uh, you will get the link to this in the follow-up email. And it just leaves me to say thank you very much to our brilliant speakers today, Roger and Amy, and thank you all for listening. As I said. This will be available uh, to watch on YouTube afterwards and you can subscribe to our HDB Dairy YouTube channel. Thank you very much and have a lovely afternoon.